Okay, so today what I want to do is actually uh, start discussing function spaces, um, but I'll, I'll go through it, um, you know, fairly, fairly quickly. Um, what I want you to take away from this, uh, from this class is I want you to be able to connect um, two slightly different things, seemingly different things that you've studied when you were, uh, when you per perhaps took a first quantum course if you've taken one before. Um, so what I want to do today is function spaces, right? So this is technically what I want to do today, but what I really want you to do, what I want you to think of is I want you to think of the fact that spin half and harmonic oscillator, right, are both examples of, um, of problems in quantum mechanics that you've studied, right? Whereas for spin half problems, you would have written something like C0, C1, right? Some matrix, which are some vector which has two entries in it, maybe they're complex and they say something, right? We will see all of this as we, uh, as we take on examples. This thing you've actually always represented essentially as a function, right? And kind of, you know, so there is this weird, slightly weird dichotomy here, or you know, disconnect here perhaps for some people where, you know, uh, perhaps you've never considered the fact that, you know, hey, how come it is that I'm discussing quantum mechanics, but half the time I'm writing things like orthogonal polynomials down, you know, I'm writing Hermit polynomials, I'm writing, you know, associated Laguerre polynomials, whatever, whatever, right? And the other half of the time, you know, I'm writing these vectors. What is this, you know, this is slightly bizarre, right? What is happening here? Why is it that I need vectors half the time and I need, you know, I need functions the other half of the time? Like, can I really, tell when I want what, right? Is this, is this very, um, is this clear to me, right? Is this clear to me as to when I want what? What is the relationship between these things, right? So these are questions that, uh, that I naturally had when I first came across, you know, um, a standard textbook of quantum mechanics, um, you know, because it, it just, you know, uh, the underlying structure is just linear vector spaces, right? And so that's what I want to just impress upon you and take you through functions. We'll actually see the functions when we actually, when we do the examples, you know, you'll do them in homeworks and so on and so forth. Uh, but what I want to impress upon you is the way to think about these things and to, and how to think with these functions, right? Which is, I think, the kind of the, 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 the bit that's, uh, that's sometimes left out, right? So to begin the discussion, let me just go back to this definition of basis, right? So in finite dimensions, right, linear vector spaces, right, I, if I said that I had a basis set phi k, right, then what I meant essentially there are three, there are three things that I will write down. There's only two principles that are underlying them, but I'll write down all three of them because, uh, you know, I like to explicitly write things down. So if I say sum over ck phi k, equals zero, then it should imply and imply by that CK is equal to zero, right? The linear independence is what we want, right? So this is linear independence, right? We also want essentially the resolution of the identity. So we want phi K, phi K summed over K to be the identity operator, right? And implied by this, both of these statements essentially, so this is resolution of the identity, um, is the fact that for any general vector V, I, it should be expressible as essentially some lambda k times phi k, right? So any general vector v must be expanded, right? This follows from the resolution, for instance. You just plug in the identity in front and it follows from it, right? So the point is that, um, is that what I want to show you essentially is what these objects look like in infinite dimensions, right? So in finite dimensions, what we did was if you wanted to write something that's like f times g, I would write something that's f i star g i i going from one to n, right? So what I what I didn't do here is specify essentially the summation, but the you know the summation goes from one to n, right? Some number n, that maybe n is right? K goes from one to n. Right? Maybe n is two. If we have uh, uh, qubits, right? Spin half problems, maybe it's 200, right? If you have something complicated, it doesn't quite matter. But what I, 
what I want to do is, I, so maybe I have a function that I actually want to represent, right? So maybe I have some function f of x, and I'm interested in, in essentially sampling f of x at some, at some set of points. So, you know, so maybe that, that's my function, and I want to know what the value of it at x1 is, at x2 is, at x3, so on and so forth, up to xn. Right, so I, I sample it at discrete points. Right, and now what I want to do is I want to compare this f to another function g, right? Now, let me note that we've already argued why you need the star there, right? The star is essentially needed uh, from our perspective because we want to make uh, the inner product of f with f. And that should be a real number so that we can associate it with things like probabilities at the end of the day, right? Because we're interested in probabilities, we have to have a root to, pro to reals, right, real positives. And so that's the reason why we are motivated to write something like that. So again, on this side, let me just draw um, g of x, right? And so maybe g of x looks like that. So again, at those points, you sample essentially g of x, right? And you write this formula down, right? So if you are sampling, essentially, you want to know how different these two functions are, right? So what you can do is you can sample them at, a fi at some finite set of points. And already you'll know that, that they're not the same, right? Because if you normalize appropriately by, let's say, divide by the mod square of the values of f, this thing is nowhere close to one, right? Because at some points, the functional values are the same, right, f and g are the same, but there are many other points where they're very, very different from each other. So when you do the inner product, Going that way, if you just interpret them as the as the individual amplitudes, of course, they're very, very different vectors, right? So when you normalize, you won't get one as the answer, right? So this is different from one. Come again. All I'm doing is I'm just taking a function f, right? I'm discretizing it, and I'm pretending that the discretized version, I'm sampling the function f and the function g at n individual points that I've chosen beforehand. And I'm pretending that this is my finite dimensional vector space. And all I'm going to do is that, so there's an interval between x1 and x2, right? I'm going to shrink that interval to zero. So I sample n infinitely many times, right? And that's just the root to function spaces. So what I'm, what I'm doing is instead of trying to convince you that if I have essentially um, in the limit that I have, a, that I have infinitely many uh, elements of a vector, of a, of a hitherto like, you know, um, finite dimensional vector. So if I take a finite dimensional vector and just keep pulling on the, on the vector so that it becomes infinite dimensional, that you can represent it as a function instead of going that route, which is, you know, which is completely unnecessary for us. I'm going the other way around. You already know functions, so just sample them at a discrete set of points, and you already know how you would, you know, well, of course, this is just, you know, functional values at that point, and they just look like a vector, you know exactly how to do everything, right? If I give you, if I made you do this thing, you know exactly how to proceed with this problem, right? So that's what I'm doing. So I'm just, I'm, I'm just using that tool to kind of uh, hint to you that, you know, I'm cheating. I'm going, I'm starting from functions, going down to finite dimension, going back up to functions, right? I'm cheating heavily, but, you know, bear with me. So. Of course, you know, what you can do is you want to essentially take this distance, right? This distance is delta and you want to shrink it down to zero, right? So what you can do instead of writing this as, as this is you can write this as sum over i going from 1 to n, right? fi star gi, right? Times delta, right? Where this delta is essentially the length of this vector, right? Uh, divided by n plus one, right? And I just take essentially the limit that uh, that n goes to infinity, right? So I have a finite, um, you know, a finite region, and I want to essentially sample the fu the function in, in on infinitely many points between the you know between let's say zero and one, right? A and B, just two points. Right, and and uh, when I do that, I essentially just have uh, you know I just I just take the uh, you know uh, so I have to multiply by this measure because this quantity essentially this limit is essentially exactly the same as integral from a to b right which is you know so if I call this point a and that point b right dx times f star of x times g of x right so all I'm doing you know is to say to you in kind of uh, complicated fashion, I'm just saying to you, hey, if you look at that object and you look at this object, 
they look the same. Right? They look the same. Yeah. Just so that when you, you know, if you want to do the, if you want to go from, uh, uh, from, um, okay. So if you want to take limits properly, right, then you have to do all of these epsilon delta arguments, right? Because remember that this thing has units of length. Dx has units of length, right? And so if you want to actually, you know, Dx over L essentially is dimensionless. So if you want to essentially take this integral, right, then you have to do it carefully. You just have to put some, you know, you have to put some delta there and then you have to shrink the delta down to zero, right? It's like doing f of x plus delta x minus f of x by delta x, limit x going to zero, uh, delta going to zero, right? It's just that delta, it's, just, it's the same object, essentially, right? So I'm just defining what my measure is over which I'm integrating, that's all, right? I'm just making a continuous space. No, if you take delta to be big, then you only sample at two places and you have no idea. Maybe you sample badly, you sample here and you sample here. And then you think that the function is the same, those two functions are the same, but you can just see by plain sight that the functions are very different from each other, right? If you want to know very accurately, right? So I can say this, you know, I mean, I'm not saying anything complicated, guys. All I'm saying is imagine the following function, right? Imagine another function that is exactly the same ex except at one point, right? How do I tell these two functions apart? If I sample at a finite set of points, I'll never be able to tell these two functions apart because I have to somehow guess that exactly at that point these two functions are different. Everywhere else I look, they're the same, right? They're actually the same on an infinite number of places. They just happen to be not, they, they just happen to not be the same exactly at one point, right? It's a concocted example, but you know, but the point I'm, I'm just trying to make is that if you want to compare two functions, if you want to say, hey, is function f of x equal to function g of x, you actually have to, in, you know, have to do this integration so that you actually sample at every point, right? So that's all, I mean, that's, that's, you know, right? Is this clear to everyone? Yeah? Okay, so this quantity is essentially the first quantity that I want to introduce to you, right? So. When we evaluate something like f star of x, g of x, right? You've done this a hundred times when you did uh, when you did standard quantum mechanics, right? If you evaluated essentially um, transition probabilities, right? All kinds of quantities of doing that kind of an integral, right? With some stuff in the middle, right? And whenever you did stuff like that, essentially what you had done was you were you were essentially evaluating something that is related to an inner product, right? So it's sandwiched with an operator typically, but you know. We're not afraid of that, right? And so th this is the first thing that I want to I want to show off to you. So what does this mean, right? What is wh what are we doing here, right? I am writing essentially. Look at what I'm doing. I'm doing something that's a sleight of hand, right? And I want you to observe the sleight of hand so that we can understand what's underneath, right? I have something that's a function f of x, and it appears back here. It appears as f star of x. But I'm writing something here which is essentially a, a, a bra. I'm writing bra f, right? And ket g, right? So you can say, look, I don't, I know what f of x is. f of x is e to the minus x squared. Like I understand what functions are, right? An example of it is e to the minus, right? I don't understand what this abstract ket is. In this context, I don't understand what this abstract ket is, right? Can you please explain to me what this abstract ket is, right? What did I, so, so this is a question that arises in your mind. Does it, right, does it not? Now, what I did previously was I went to each of these points. So when I first wrote this cat i, right, who's, so I could write essentially f as sum over f i times i, and then you would imagine that that's the inner product, right? If I wrote the vector expanded like that in some basis, that's the inner product. Let's keep the basis simple. And let's say that, you know, i equals zero is essentially one, all zeros. i equals one is zero, one, all zeros, right? So on and so forth. Then what am I doing? What am I doing when I do f of x? When I sample at a, at a point, at a point like x1, right? What am I doing? I am asking, hey, can you tell me what is f of x? at x equals x1, right? So the basis vector that I'm associating with it, which is this, right? So let's 
to not confuse you, um, let's actually label them one through n, right? So when I say one all zeros, what I actually mean is I only want to ask where, what, how much the function f is, what its value is at x equals x1. When I ask the basis vector two, I just want to know how much, you know, how big is this function f, f of x at x equals x2, right? Sorry, I forgot you had a question before. Go ahead. Exactly. Not yet, but it's going to become. No, no. So, so all I'm saying is I could start with a discrete, I could start with a discrete set of points, right? A finite set of points more correctly, right? I could start with a finite set of points and what I could do essentially is, um, is assign essentially a vector space inside it. And the way I would, I would assign it is I would just say, you know, I can do it mathematically, but you know, just intuitively what I mean is if, please, when I say the, the ket one, what I mean is when I multiply ket one with an abstract ket f, I am just asking you what is the value of f at f of x equals x1, right? So let me just write this for a second. This quantity, right, is the same as asking one f, right? So instead of one, I could have just called it x1, right? So when I, when I, when you give me the value, what am I writing? I'm just writing f of x1. Right? I don't know if that resolves the issue that you have. So I'm sampling at a finite set of points, xi, right? And I'm writing essentially the value of some function, which we know as just simply a, fun a, a function, right? A standard function. But I can think of it as the projection of an abstract at f onto essentially a basis x1. And what the basis does is it just picks out the value at x1. Is this clear? Yeah? Did you have a question? I could and I could just write down the definitions, but yeah, I, I'm, I'm trying to be intuitive. I perhaps I'm failing at this task. There are any number of quantities where finite suffices, right? Spin half just has two levels. Right, so the way, so remember again, so you have to connect all these pieces of intuition. That's a great question, right? So the, the question is what about, like when is finite dimensions enough? When is infinite dimensions necessary, right? In all cases where you have a continuous variable underneath, you have to be in the infinite dimensional space. There's no, essentially there's no go, right? But the point is that if there are many, many physically relevant problems which are entirely in finite dimensions. For instance, just the spin half problem. There's just, you know, how we started this entire discussion was by looking at the Sternger-Lock experiment with just two outcomes and we said, hey, this thing has two outcomes. Maybe we need something that's like a zero and maybe we need something that's like a one. I see superposition, right? I see interference pattern, so maybe we need a linear theory, right? This was this list of maybes that we put down, right? And they are the axioms of the underlying theory. So from that perspective, right, we have to accept linearity because experiments show it off. Right? And we have to expect, uh, because we are in constructing linear vector spaces, hence we're constructing linear vector spaces, we have to choose the appropriate basis. And the appropriate basis question, what was it in the Sternger Luck experiment? It was how many outcomes, measurement outcomes do you have, right? Many of you have done measurements, right? If you just look at essentially an ammeter, it's just a current. And the current can have infinitely many values. Right, it's in a finite range, let's say zero to five volts, or um, just zero to five amperes, sorry, right? But between that number, zero to five or zero to one, whatever normalized units, it can just have an infinite number of value. Every value is allowed, right? In practice, this thing, you know, is only correct up to two decimal places, blah, 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 but this is, this is an in-practice statement. It's not, a, it's not a profound theoretical statement, right? And so in theory, it can have up to infinite decimal places, it could be different, right? I mean, it should just be, so you have a continuous variable there. And now you have to ask essentially, well, how many, vector, how many basis vectors do I assign to this quantity? I want to describe the physics, right, of some quantum mechanical thing where the end result is essentially something that looks like a current, 
right? Something that's a continuous variable, right? For those of you who know, who know, you know, um, who've done any optics, essentially, homodyning, heterodyning, these are all quantities that produce infinite dimensions, right? And the underlying reason is because the harmonic oscillator is infinite dimensional, right? Electric electric fields are described by harmonic oscillator, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's the difference between doing a finite sum and doing an integration. Integration has a measure attached to it, always. It's just a, it's a silly point. It's not, it's not anything. It's not anything profound, right? I don't mean to scare you with this delta. I mean, all I'm writing, all I'm saying to you is, is two things. If you have to sum a finite series, that's how you would do it, right? But if you had to essentially do integration, you have to bring in or essentially what you're integrating over. Because why? Because this index i disappears and it's replaced essentially with a functional value x which means you have to integrate over x, right? It's just, it's calculus essentially. I don't understand your question, sorry. Are you asking about basis transformations and continuous variables? It gives you the projection of the of the abstract ket onto the basis, right? Let me just, sorry, I want to, I want to let you ask your question. I'm just saying what you're saying in, 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 in words that I understand, right? So if I have a function, if I have a finite dimensional vector f, and I want to ask what is its projection onto some i, like well, what is what is the inner product of it with i? I essentially just get fi, if I, you know, and if i is a basis, then essentially these coefficients are the expansion coefficients to expand the function f in that basis i, right? Uh, we're clear up to now, ask me your question. Yes. It's the other way around. I'm actually trying to tell you that, look, what you mean by f of x equals one equals five, right? So when you make a statement, when you make a statement, f of x, you know, at x equals one, this functional value is equal to five, right? When you make the statement, what is the statement you're making, right? The statement you're making is you're saying, take the function, ignore it everywhere except at one point, which is x equals one, and at that point, if you look at the function, the value of it is five, right? This is the, this is the statement you're making, right? So I'm just saying, look, this thing essentially looks like, right, looks like an abstract ket. You can assign it to an abstract ket. And in fact, what happens is you can just say that the functional value is the inner product of the abstract ket with the abstract function, right? Just the other way around, right? So you can, you can essentially say that this quantity over here f of x, you can assign it essentially to x inner product with f, right? There's, there's nothing profound, you could do it the other way around, there's nothing profound about this, right? So all I'm saying, now what am I saying? Why is this a basis, right? It's intuitive to understand why it's a basis. Because if you take, if you say every point is assigned with some value x, right? Then no two points are the same, so somehow, we don't yet know how, I will build all of this in a second, but somehow inner products are already orthonormal. Because, you know, no two points are the same. So if you ask, is this point another point, right? So if you say, my function f is essentially some point x, it's the abstract entity of some point x, is this point another point x prime? Then the answer is essentially zero if x not equal to x prime, right? We don't know what this is if x equals x prime, but let's just leave it alone for a moment. So already it seems, and it seems like if I prescribe, right, uh, a function over all space, I've prescribed the function, I've told you what the function is, right? 
I've told you what the function is. Now you can rotate basis as well. You can do all of the games you did before instead of, you know, instead of X and Y axis being this way, you can rotate everything that way and you can say, hey, now what is the, what does my function look like? Okay, no problem, right? You know how to do all of this in standard kind of basic mathematics, right? So what I'm saying to you are essentially just a couple of things, just a couple of things that I just want you to understand carefully and for the purposes of, of essentially the quantum mechanics that I hope that we will discuss. So statement number one is essentially that inner products are replaced essentially by integrals of this form, right? So whenever I see inner product, whenever I write this inner product, I have to replace it with essentially something that goes like a to b dx, right? So I have to I have to essentially replace it with a to b dx, right? The second thing that I have to do essentially is I have to write, um, I have to write, I need an inner product essentially which behaves properly, right? I need a basis which behaves properly, so I expect my basis to have this kind of a relationship, right? And let me just put a question mark here just to say, just, just to say that I don't know what it is yet, but we will see what it is in a second. Just give me one second and you'll see exactly what it is. The third thing that you want is completeness, right? That's the reason that I left it on the board here, right? So the third thing, so the second thing that you want just to kind of write this again, x prime x, right? should have some interesting property, right? So it should be zero if x not equal to x prime, right? And we don't know what it is yet if x equals x prime, right? And so you could just say one, right? You could say I expect it to be one, right? But just hang on for a second because one is not the answer, right? And we'll just see why. And the very last thing that we want essentially out of Right. So, what did we what did we say when we did um, when we did finite dimensional vectors? We said inner products essentially should be you know um, you know well inner products we can make them orthonormal, right? I mean the basis doesn't have to be orthonormal, but we can Gram Schmidt and make everything orthonormal. Um, outer products end up you know uh, having to resolve the identity, right? So the, so the basis itself has to essentially be linearly independent, blah, 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 right? Uh, which is sufficient if you can prove orthonormality, right? And, and the correct dimensionality in the vector space. Uh, the, the last essential thing is the resolution of identity. Because if you can do this, then all functions you know you can represent, right? Because that's the exact same statement that you proved in homework one, which is prove that all kets essentially are decomposable in terms of a basis, you know? That relationship that you prove, that's exactly the analog. The, 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 the function space analog of it is what you're doing. It's just sitting inside an integral, right? Essentially, again, this is what you just have to get used to for a little bit and, and, and then there are no problems, which is everywhere that you are essentially making multiplications, right, uh, you will end up doing integration, right? Because that's the multiplication followed by summation, you'll do integration and you can see why that is just from, just from this example here. Right, that that's perhaps the correct way to kind of replace one with the other, right? So now we have an interesting conundrum. So I'll build up uh, what this is. So I'll leave this on the board and fill out, fill out what this quantity is in a second. So now consider what we what I've just said. I've said x times f is what is defined as f of x. Right? I said that's that's what we that's what we were meaning to say, so let's just say that, right? But of course I can always essentially what 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 is the trick that I always play? F of x is x times identity acting on f. That should always be true. That's the meaning of the identity operator, right? That it actually doesn't change the vector f, so you know this thing is trivially follows, right? So this is of course integral dx prime, x, x prime, x prime f. Everyone sees this? And this quantity essentially is integral dx prime times x, x prime times f of x prime. This is what? f of x. What is this? I've just taken the two definitions that I've written on the two demands that I have, right? One is that the function is representable essentially as the uh, the functional value at x is representable as that inner product, 
right? And the second is that the resolution of the identity should just be the outer product, right? I still don't know how to handle these things, but because we've done the finite dimensional cases ca carefully, we can just write this kind of abstract statements to be true, right? Yeah? I, I just, by identity, I mean this quantity, right? And by by that point, what, what I mean is essentially that if I take any function and multiply by that, make that operation, the identity operation, it should just return back the function to me, right? Just like what it means for vectors. For vectors, the identity operator is defined as that object, which if you multiply, you know, that object by the vector simply returns the vector for every vector in the space. So for every function that exists, if you can essentially show that the identity operator acting on the function is just the function itself, then you're done, right? And all that we've done is just that. We've taken ffx and acted the on, on the identity on it, right? Now, this is very bizarre if you think about it, right? Because what is this ffx prime, right? I hope you, first of all, I hope you noticed, right? Don't repeat your indices. Right? Don't do it in finite dimensions, don't do it in infinite dimensions. This is an integral, that's, so it's summed over, right? So you understand, do, do all of you understand, if I essentially say integral dx times f of x, right, from minus one to one, does this depend on x? No, it's just a number, right? It's just a thing like trapezoid rule or whatever, right? You're just summing a bunch of things. It's just a number. It just doesn't care about what your x is, right? So this thing is this thing is a dummy index x prime. So it should never appear essentially, you know, before or after, is you know, inside the. So what I've done is essentially I wrote x, so I wrote x prime here, right? So this is the first rule that I just want you to remember. The second is a personal uh, preference of mine which I want to pass on to you as well, and I'll tell you the logic of it. Please always write, it is my recommendation to you, please always write your integrals along with the integration variables and the limits all in the same place, right? Because what will happen as you start doing things like quantum field theory, like you know, advanced quantum mechanics and quantum field theory is you'll have several integrals that you have to do, right? Oftentimes you'll have seven integrals that you have to do, right? And what will happen is if you're careless, right, as, as, as humans tend to be, you'll write integral dx from minus one to one, right, integral dy from minus two to two, integral dz from minus three to three, right? If you write it this way, there's never a problem. But typically what happens is that people will write integral minus one to one, integral minus two to two, integral minus three to three, right, f of x, y, z, right, dx, dy, dz, right? And you have to pray to God that you never confuse these indices because if you do, you are integrating over the wrong limits, right? So I just avoid all of this confusion by always writing it this way, right? This way is much better just from the standpoint of you never making these mistakes. I got used to it at some point and now, you know, things are much more are much more better for me, right? So, just a point on style, uh, a slight, a slight, dig uh, you know, a slight digression on style. So, let's go back to this, right? So, this is what we want. Now, what does that mean, right? What is f of x prime? It's the functional value at every point x prime, right? At a point x prime. So, th this quantity, which I, which I said, I don't know what it is, right? essentially has to be zero everywhere and has to be such that when you integrate over it with f of x prime, it just produces the functional value at x, right? So what is this doing? This quantity is picking out x from the list x prime, right? From this whole integral, which is just a list of values of x prime, like an infinite collection of values of x prime, it's picking out exactly one number, which is x, the value of x, right? So this thing is assigned a name, essentially. So it's, Let's call the Dirac delta function, and let me be 
even more specific and say that this is the one dimensional Dirac delta function, right? Because there are higher dimension, higher dimensional versions of this that you can also see, right? So the Dirac delta function is a quantity which is, you know, quite analogous to the Kronecker delta function, which we also saw, right? But what the Dirac delta function does is it serves an important role inside of function spaces. And the role that it serves is, the, is to essentially satisfy you know, um, all of these inner product things that we're trying to do, right? All of these consistency rules that we're trying to establish on top of functions, right? So if the Dirac delta function behaves the way that I've just written down in the box, right? You could take that almost uh, as the definition of the Dirac delta function, right? So if you, if the Dirac delta function behaves this way, right, then it does exactly what we want it to do. Right? So I could write this essentially with integral dx prime delta x minus x prime f of x prime, right? Right? And whatever the limits of the integration are, are the limits of the integration. Wherever the function is defined is where the, what the limits of the integration are, right? Uh, quite typically it's just everywhere, right? It's typically minus infinity infinity, but you could just switch off the function somewhere and you know, and it's no problem, right? So what do we want this quantity, right? So we want f of x to be equal to the integral minus infinity infinity dx prime delta x minus x prime f of x prime for all functions f of x, right? This is what we want. So I hope that all of you notice that I put the word function inside quotation marks, right? And this is because essentially the Dirac delta function is not quite a function. It's essentially what's called a distribution, and it's a whole, it's a whole thing, right? That um, that I uh, I'm I'm sure will be discussed at some length in your math physics class, right? But for our purposes, what I want you to take away from it is that the Dirac delta function only makes sense if it's sitting inside an integral, right? Inside an integral, this quantity is very well defined. It, you know exactly how it works. You can you can uh, you can act with it, right? You can act it on functions and you can get out results that you're interested in. We're going to use it all the time, right? But sitting by itself, it's a bit of a troublesome creature, right? So you just have to be careful about, about how you think about it, right? But um, that's about as much as I will say. What I want to do is essentially write down all of the properties of the delta function, representations of delta function, so on and so forth, which are far more important for, you know, for, uh, for you to practice quantum mechanics, right? Now, let's specifically choose the following function. Right, name the simplest function that you know. Sin x, right? Can you name something simpler than sin x? X, okay, name even something even simpler than x. Constant function, right? Let me just choose the number one, right? So if I choose f of x equals one, then what do you get? The, the what you get is minus infinity to infinity dx delta function of x minus x prime times the number one is the number one. Right, so I can just erase this one. Right, and that's the definition of what the delta function is, and that's just the normalization for it. Right, and we'll see that all of these, you know, you can you can generalize a little bit as well. Right, okay. So, so what I want you to understand, take away from from this discussion right is I want you to try and understand what a delta function is actually trying to do right what it's trying to do is again I have my favorite object f of x versus x right some function right and I want to ask what is the functional value over there right I have chosen a point x Right? And I want to ask at x prime equals x, what is the functional value, right? And so, if I want you to do this, and I want you to do this on a graph paper, what would you do? So if I said, please, I give you, you know, I'll tell you the answer, but if I give you a graph paper and I say, please, I want to come back, a function is plotted for you, I don't want to see anything except the functional value at x. What do you do? You just put a mask on it. Right? You just put a sheet of paper and just cut out a very thin sliver so that at x I can see it, at no other point can I see it, right? So the mathematical way to do this is essentially just to multiply by zero everywhere, right? So you just kill the function. 
right? And you have to multiply by something over here, right? So there's a thin strip that I've just cut out, right? What is the area of this strip? It's the unit, right? It's unity, it's one, because that's just the area under the curve of this delta function. It's zero everywhere, and there's a thin strip where it is, where it is some height that I don't know, but essentially the point is that I need that the area of this object to be essentially one, right? Huh? Because when you multiply, it can't be f of x because f of x is too is too special. You are asking, right? Look at the look at what what this is. This is the convolution of a function with another function. So you multiply these two functions at every point and then you essentially add them up. That's what that this relationship means, right? So it can't be f of x at x. It has to essentially just be pull out the value of f of x when you multiply with f of x and you integrate over. So you just have to have it be some number, right? And you, you will be tempted to say why not plus one, right? And I'll show you that if it's plus one, then it's essentially the integral normalization disappears, right? So it will in fact be infinity. This is the answer, right? But the intuition that you have, oh, why not just make delta function at, at the value x just be equal to the functional value at x, right? The problem with that is I haven't told you what function it is. So your delta function will now start depending on what, the, right? This doesn't make any sense. That's not, in fact, that is not what's written in the box, right? What's written in the box is that when you multiply delta function x minus x prime with f of x prime and integrate over, so sum over all values for a given value of x, it should just produce that functional value of x, f of x, right? Which means when you multiply, it should switch off all other functional values, so multiply by zero everywhere else. At that point, multiply by something so that when you when you do integral, the area under the curve is one, right? Is that clear to you? So now if I take the, right, can everyone see this diagram? This is, so if I take the thickness of this essentially to be two epsilon, right? Just, I just give it some number, symmetric, right, about the center. Then what is the height of this? It's one over two epsilon, right? Now how big can I choose epsilon to be? I center this thing at the value x, right? So let's say x equals one. I center it at one, so it's just a box, right? That's symmetrically spaced about one. And now the question that I have to ask is how thick can this box be? The function has values not just at one, but at all neighborhood points, right? All the points around one. So if epsilon is too big, essentially, it captures not just f of x, but its neighbors as well. So essentially, you have to take epsilon to zero, right? So the width has to go to zero, so that you only catch the center. So what happens to the height? There you go, right? So that's the reason these are weird functions, right? These are weird functions because there's zero everywhere and then and then essentially infinity at one point, right? And so they're very strange objects. Doing derivatives on this and so on and so forth are, you know, you have to be subtle, you have to be careful about it, right? So that's that's the reason, right? So you have to take, you have to take epsilon, you have to take the limit epsilon going to zero, right? So how do you do this? In practice, how do you do this? If I ask you to now evaluate, right, calculate the function, functional value f of x at x equals like x zero, let's say, right? And I say, please do it, but do it with this kind of a filter function, right? So this construction essentially, right, is called a filter function construction. So it just filters the, general function f of x at, at, a, at one point in a window, essentially, right? And in electronics, you're constructing objects like this all the time, right? So what I can do essentially is I can construct essentially this, the following integral, 
So what I've just said in words to you, I can write essentially as that integral relationship, right? And what that means essentially is from this, it follows that the delta function x minus x naught can be defined essentially as the limit epsilon going to zero, one over two epsilon, right? For x naught minus epsilon less than x less than x naught plus epsilon and zero otherwise. So let me just write this carefully. Which means it's literally infinity at x equals x naught and zero everywhere else, right? Right? So, let me just fix my notation, that's x naught, that's function of x and x, right? All the same. Is this the only choice for delta function? To take that square, right? Is this the only choice, right? We can take Gaussian functions, right? We can take essentially all kinds of different functions. What we first, before we get down to the examples, right, and I have several examples here, what I want to show you is, or what I want to simply intuit for you is the, um, is all of the properties, right? So I've already written down two properties. So, right, properties of a delta function representation that we expect, right, the first of these is integral dx f of x delta x minus x naught is f of x naught. The second of these is integral dx, it follows from this essentially, delta function x minus x naught is one, right, this two follows from one. And the third thing that we want is delta function x minus x naught, you want it to be delta function x naught minus x, right? Because when you're asking for the functional value at x naught, Right? It shouldn't matter whether you have x minus x naught or x naught minus x, right? You want this to be true. Just take it to be true, right? Take this property to be true, right? And from these, essentially, you can construct a, a, a bunch of examples, all of which are symmetric functions, right? And so let me write down several examples. So the general principle is that we must consider Right? So we must consider symmetric functions with this parameter epsilon, so that when you take essentially epsilon going to zero, you recover the functional value, right? So the properties that I've just listed are true, right? So I, give, I will just state without proof several examples. Again, I presume that these things will be considered elsewhere. Right? So these are these are what are called Lorentzians. Right? Right, this thing also looks like this, it's just a kink at the, no. at the origin. 
Example three. Right, so this is a Gaussian, right? Just like somebody was suggesting, and uh, the Gaussian function centered at x equals zero, right? And Right? Now, what I want you to do, I think this is very good exercise for you, I can't uh, unfortunately dwell on this too much, is I want you to actually go home and try and plot these functions, you know, honestly, right? Just sit in a corner and try and figure out how you would plot these functions, right? This is fantastic exercise, I, I guarantee you that you will get a lot out of it, right? Because let me just consider this example, right? So secant hyperbolic essentially is, is secant hyperbolic is essentially one over cos hyperbolic, right? Right? And cos hyperbolic is like e to the x plus e to the minus x. So when x goes off to minus infinity, one of them blows up and the other one doesn't. And when x goes off to plus infinity, it's the other way around. Right, and so essentially, if you just square this entire thing, right, you just get something that looks like that, right? And you have to invert it, right? So you you have to go plot this. I don't, I don't want to dwell on this too much, right? So example five. Right? So does everyone know what sine x over x looks like? Is it an even function of x? Good, you have to go, you have, if you don't know, you have to go do this at home, right? Sine x is an odd function of x, x is an odd function of x. So the ratio of these things is an even function of x. And what happens with this is essentially that it does something like that, right? And this first zero essentially is at x equals pi epsilon, right? And so what happens is that as you take epsilon to zero, that, that zero shrinks. It only picks up the, 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 the center, right? So I'm... What I'm trying to tell you um, right now in all of these representations is about a week's worth of uh, worth of information. So you know, so what I want you to do is go home, and I'll just tell you what you should do. Go home and essentially try and carefully work through each of these functions, do integrations with them, put arbitrary functions inside, try and evaluate essentially the limit going to zero, right? So evaluate the function and then take the limit going to zero. Right? And you'll see that some representations work much better than others for, you know, for some functions. And that's how we end up with kind of a zoo of representations of the Dirac Delta function, right? Because depending on what you're doing, essentially there's one of these representations which is preferable to the other ones, right? Because it depends on what the integral you're evaluating, right? So if you have, if you have an integral to evaluate where by sticking a Gaussian in there, you can actually do the integral just very quickly, that's, you know, that's the way to think about why there are these many objects sitting around, right? So the very last thing I'm going to do, again, um, this is part of your general math physics education, um, but very, very relevant to quantum mechanics as well. So, um, you know, hopefully by seeing this repeatedly, you will, you will gain 
a lot out of it. Um, so, Right? How many of you have seen the heaviside unit step function? The engineers have, right? Uh, right? Because it essentially just switches on. So for the for the rest of you, what this is is it's a very nice uh, thing that you would imagine uh, constructing if you if you hadn't come across. If this wasn't named already, you would definitely discover it yourself. Which is suppose I have some physics, right? So I say, you know, a ball is thrown at you know at time t equals zero, and then it's kicked. There's a little firecracker on it, and I just and the firecracker goes off at t equals five. Now tell me what happens, right? And you just you ignore essentially the the basic dynamics of it. So you go into a frame of reference where the ball is not moving, and but after a certain amount of time, something happens, right? So this kind of physics happens all the time, right? You switch on an interaction. And then after a while, you switch it off. You shine a laser beam, you shine it off, you know, and then you turn it off. This kind of physics happens all the time. So what you want is a function that is zero everywhere, and at some point switches on to plus one, right, and just remains plus one. Because if you shift it, take a, you know, invert it, then you can switch off the function as well, right? So this is already built into the theta function, to this function, right? So the heavy side unit step function is simply defined like this, right? And x minus x naught, and this is x naught. Right? So it's zero, it's zero everywhere before x naught, and it's plus one after x naught. It's also related to something called the ramp function, right? So, but you can essentially see the following, right? Which is, let me consider x versus tan hyperbolic of x, right? What's the minimum value that the tan hyperbolic can have? Maximum? Right? So this thing essentially goes from minus one to plus one. Right? And if you do tan hyperbolic of 10x, right? So just do it at home. Then it essentially looks like this. Right? Now what, are, what can you suspect? essentially. If you take, you know, tan hyperbolic of x over epsilon and take epsilon to zero, then it just becomes essentially the heavy side unit step function, but one minus, right? So instead of going from essentially zero to one, it's going from minus one to plus one, right? So if, if you divide by two and do some manipulations, you can get it down to the unit step function, right? So you can define essentially tan hyperbolic, you know, x over epsilon, right? half of it, right, and that will go from minus half to plus half, right, and if you add a half to it, that goes from zero to one, right, and you can imagine that this thing is essentially just the theta function of x, limit epsilon going to zero, right, just tends to the theta function of x, right. Now you can take, why am I writing this, because you can take the theta function, and you can play around with it, right? You can take the, sorry, the tan hyperbolic function, you can play around with it. And most importantly, we've just established that the tan hyperbolic function is in fact related to the, um, uh, to the Dirac delta function, right? So what you can now do is the following, which is you can do, ask what d by dx of tan hyperbolic x is, and this is one minus tan hyperbolic x squared, right? So this quantity, if you plot it, essentially looks like 
So I'm plotting for f of x, right? So essentially looks like that. Tan hyperbolic of x goes from minus one to one, so the square goes from, you know, essentially goes from zero to one, and one minus it essentially goes from zero to one again. But where the tan hyperbolic is zero, which is at the origin, right? The functional value is is one, right? Uh, sorry, so this is tan hyperbolic square of x, and one minus tan hyperbolic square of x essentially looks like the looks like the opposite, right? So this thing is tan hyperbolic square, and this is one minus tan hyperbolic square. Of x, right? So what what you can see, right? So I've just said a bunch of math at you. So let me just say it in words. What is, what what is the Heaviside unit step function do? It goes, switches on, and just stays there. What does its derivative do? It's zero everywhere, and then just blows up at that point. So it looks a lot like mysteriously looks a lot like a delta function, right? So what it kind of suggests to you is if you took the Heaviside unit step function, a representation of it, and took a derivative of it, and then took the limit going to zero, then you should get the Dirac delta function. And that's exactly what we've just done, right? What we've done is we've just plotted the uh, representation of the, ta of the Heaviside unit step function by first considering the tan hyperbolic function, which goes from minus one to one, so just adjust the height, scale and adjust the height, and that's just a, heavy side unit step function in the limit that x goes to zero, right? And then what I've done was I just took one derivative and showed you that that thing essentially looks like what you expect from a delta function to look like, right? And so this is another representation of the delta function, right? There's epsilons floating somewhere, right? And so in your homework, essentially what I've done is I've asked you to consider carefully um, all of these representations, right? And, uh, and you'll see them, you'll use them again and again. So I wanted to do one visual example here, essentially, um, just so that you can get that intuition as well. And how much time do we have? Okay, we're almost out of time. So the very last thing I'll do before I go today is the Fourier representation. Right, in some sense, perhaps the most important representation. Right? So the delta function of x is limit epsilon going to zero, sine x over epsilon divided by pi x, right? But this is also equal to one over two pi limit one over epsilon, which is defined as k going to infinity integral minus k to k, dq e to the i q x, right? And it's in fact valid for both plus and minus signs uh, because you're new to all of this. So let me just show you the integral. It's only a couple of lines that you have to work out. So just consider the integral i, which is one over two pi, integral minus a to a dq, e to the i q x, right? I'll do it for plus sign, you'll just see that it doesn't matter. So make the substitution i q x, make the substitution to t. Um, the integral essentially, so what this means is that the integral limits go from minus i a x to plus i a x and uh, the Integration measure goes from dq to dt divided by ix, right? And so the integral i essentially becomes one over two pi integral minus i a x to i a x times dt e to the t divided by i x, which you can do, and this is just e to the t divided by two pi i x going from minus i a x to plus i a x, which you can verify is just sine a x over pi x, right? And so if you just take that limit now, then everything is okay, right? What this essentially means is if I choose, so I want to say it in words to you, right? If I choose essentially a particular 
value of q, right? Uh, sorry, a particular value of x, and then I do this integral. I am essentially picking the the functional the functional value at that point x, right? This is the this is what we learned with delta functions, right? But you also have this other point of view of the Fourier transform, essentially, as something which just tells you what the frequency distribution of the function is, right? And so if you just essentially pick one of the function, one of the Fourier components, and you essentially integrate, right, out, then you get the value of the of the of the function at that point in Fourier space, right? So that's exactly, so this this idea of essentially picking a point, right? So for instance, what, you know, I have a, I have a, I have a function and, and uh, what is the functional value at the point x? I could have asked this essentially saying I have a function which has a Fourier decomposition. What is its, you know, uh, or it has a Fourier transform. What is the f value of the Fourier transform at this point, right? And it's the same question essentially, underlying this is the same, is the same, I want to have a thing that picks out the value of a function at a point, right? So hopefully, once you've digested this, um, I'm promised that uh, that uh, um, that this is, the math physics class will also handle this. So uh, once you've digested this through both of our lectures, uh, I'm hoping that you'll actually see the, the connections between, or begin to see the connections between this quantum mechanics that we need, right? Why did we introduce this? We needed inner products, outer products, right? And now we have this powerful machine, which is the Dirac delta function. And using this, we'll be able to evaluate all kinds of crazy things, right? Um, and using this machinery, hopefully I've also shown you that, you know, when you start thinking about functions, you don't need to kind of take off your linear vector space hat, put it somewhere, and wear another hat, which is, you know, your, uh, uh, orthogonal polynomials hat, right? So next class, very quickly, what I will do is I will take you through orthogonal polynomials as it relates to us. So I'll take you through uh, uh, through Hermit polynomials. I'll take you through, you know, all of these different, um, you know, um, associated log like all of these different um, even sines and cosines, right? I'll do the I'll do the uh, uh, just the standard basis as well. So we'll go through all of these uh, all of these uh, uh, examples of orthogonal polynomials, um, and hopefully you'll see essentially the relationship between these inner products, outer products, and all these things that we've constructed in finite dimensions, their infinite dimensional analogs, and specifically their relationship to quantum mechanics, right? Because on the one hand, you would write something in a, when you solve the harmonic oscillator problem. On the one hand, you will just write the ket n, the number of you know, the number ket n, right? The Fox state n, right? For those of you who've seen it before. And uh, on the other hand, you will write something that uh, essentially uh, looks like an orthogonal polynomial, right? And what I want you to start making contact with is that is the relationship between them is basically the relationship between an abstract function f and f of x, right? So if you take basically, if you take the number of, you know, the number state n, right? And you take, ask what is the inner product of this, right? With some position n, uh, x, this is essentially what produces this, this kind of a quantity, right? So we'll see all of these relationships tomorrow. Um, okay, so I'll just, I'll stop now.